right, so we have, thank you everyone for coming. We have building identity for an open perimeter with Tejas Dharamshi. Tejas is a senior security software engineer at Netflix. Tejas specializes in security and is focused on corporate identity and access, multi-factor authentication, adaptive authentication, and user-focused security at scale. Please welcome Tejas to Shellcon. All right, finally we are up and going. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Tejas. Uh, I'm a senior security software engineer at Netflix. Uh, so basically Netflix is a microservice environment, so we are building out services and tools that focus on making our like applications really secure uh, and safe. Um, and talking about safe uh, and all the issues that we've had so far, I had a 32 character like password for my Gmail account, uh, so it just took forever to get this thing going on a anyways. Uh, so, uh, primarily, we, uh, the things uh, that I focus on are on identity management, access management, uh, uh, single sign-on, uh, and that includes adaptive authentication. And we want to make our security story really user-focused, so uh, user-focused security as well. Uh, before we dive more into uh, the actual identity landscape at uh, Netflix itself, I uh, just want to give a, key, a quick peek into what our ecosystem is all about uh, uh, and see how uh, our story uh, uh, falls align. So we have uh, apps that are uh, actually managing the entire uh, ecosystem of our studios that basically manages the full life cycle starting from uh, inception, pre-production, production, production uh, the all nine yards of a production. Uh, then we have applications that basically manage uh, our relationship with our device partners. Uh, so they, uh, to get the, the, to basically get Netflix on uh, all devices. Uh, then we have applications that manage our relationship with internet service providers all over the world uh, so that you can get the most awesome experience on Netflix uh, when you go to netflix.com, right? Uh, and we have a range of engineering applications that's helping us uh, drive really fast uh, uh, to uh, help solve all our uh, business use cases. And we have a range of SaaS applications. So what we're talking about is right now 700 uh, plus applications and the number is constantly uh, on, a, uh, on a progression. So, so a lot of applications and various use cases. Uh, like all of you, uh, we want to make sure like we are making, uh, making Netflix really safe, especially for uh, the apps at which, uh, the rate at which they're working. Uh, one thing you, that makes us uh, different uh, is our culture, and I'll talk about like how our culture plays uh, a role in how we uh, focus on security specifically. So two years ago, this was a typical setup that we had. We had a secure network perimeter. Uh, and uh, and then we had managed devices. So anyone who actually wanted to get uh, uh, connected to our applications, they basically jump on a VPN uh, and then connect to these applications uh, using their identity. Uh, and uh, that basically protects all the sensitive data that uh, we have in our ecosystem. And that we, uh, but what used to happen in that same time period is people connect from any open network, like you go to Starbucks and you can freely connect. Uh, and the only thing you have to do is jump on a VPN and uh, access applications. So we started questioning ourselves whether we really want to trust the network uh, that you uh, uh, connect uh, to access our applications. Uh, and uh, this is where our location independent security approach uh, 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 helped us move away from that mindset. So if, uh, if all, uh, if, if you guys are aware of like the Google's Beyond Corp model, this is kind of uh, aligned to that as well. So we said, okay, let's great. Uh, let's let's uh, not worry about like uh, what network you come from. Let's treat all network as insecure and uh, treat them accordingly. Uh, another interesting aspect, and this is where our culture comes into picture, is uh, uh, freedom and responsibility. Uh, so what we believe is people uh, people really strive uh, with freedom, and they are really like worthy of the freedom. So you can go into any uh, store, buy a device, let that be a laptop, iPad, phone, whatever, and connect to uh, connect to the network, and then you just uh, uh, can access our applications. So then we were. This is kind of contrary to what we uh, w were in the setup in terms of managed devices. Uh, now we have any kind of devices connecting to access our applications. So we're like. Let's just not worry about managed devices anymore. Uh, and all we have is insecure networks, unmanaged devices, and people are just trying to get access to our applications. So how do we go from the two year ago story to where we want to actually reach? So that's what uh, today I'm gonna cover in terms of how we have gone, uh, how, do, how have we covered this particular distance so far. 
but if you just take a look at a, from a bird's eye view, uh, uh, what it is is there are users who are basically trying to access applications. And when they're trying to access applications, what we want is some sort of a really strong uh, proofing of that identity uh, via strong authentication. And uh, that needs to account for a range of things, and we'll cover in depth like what are the range of things that we look out for. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it needs to cover a range of things. Uh, once a user is strongly authenticated to these applications, uh, then uh, applications, they basically want to consume the same identity. Right? Uh, they might want to uh, take that uh, identity information and use it for a whole bunch of different purposes. It could be giving access to you to uh, access to sensitive resources, or it might be giving you uh, using those same uh, information for applying uh, uh, fine grain authorization rules. Right? That can be anything. So we want some sort of way for uh, 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 for streaming this particular identity information down to applications. And in all of this. Uh, we ha would have increased like the security story around it, but how can we make all of this frictionless, uh, both from uh, an end-user perspective as well as applications who are who wanted who are wanting to make their applications secure, right? So, so that's a really high level of what we would want to achieve by this. So, at the core of this is the identity itself, right? So, uh, in our in our ecosystem, the uh, the identity landscape is broken down into two uh, main categories. One is uh, the corporate uh, landscape, wherein all our employees, contractors, uh, and the CS folks who uh, uh, are basically bucketed under. So we, we term them as workforce identity. And then we have partners. And uh, partners is quite wide uh, in our ecosystem. And these are people uh, who are responsible for various facets uh, that are helping drive our business. So they are basically managing, uh, these are users who are our partner users who are basically helping us with our localization, sub dubs, like pre-post production. Uh, these are studio users who are actually uh, working on our productions. Or these are device partners or open connect partners. So all of those, we term them as partners. And at a really high level, they're broken down into uh, these two main uh, categories. And we really don't want this to happen, uh, wherein we have identity so, uh, silos, uh, and that just not leads to duplicate identities, but in general, like how do we go about securing uh, all these underlying uh, different storage if at all that was a route we went, uh, we went up going. So what we have done is streamline that, uh, uh, again, into two different uh, buckets at the really top. Uh, on the workflow side, we ha uh, our identities originate from our HR system Workday, and they are streamed into Google, for which uh, we use primarily for our uh, authentication purposes. Uh, on the partner side, we have a homegrown solution, uh, and we, uh, we put them into our homegrown uh, directory service, uh, and all those identities are housed there. So great, so now we have unified like these two uh, uh, classes of identities, and in general, if I talk about the numbers, we have 130,000 uh, plus uh, identities in, the, in that ecosystem overall, uh, and it's on a constant uh, progression considering the rate at which our productions are growing. So, uh, uh, so we are talking about like quite a large population uh, as such. So now how do we go about establishing like some sort of a really strong trust in who uh, in the incoming authentication request uh, in our uh, in our uh, uh, in our uh, at, at Netflix basically So the core of it is obviously the first factor uh, wherein basically you go about using your username and credentials and uh, and that's how you start like the establishment of the trust uh, process but I'm guessing like we all are on the same page in terms of how passwords are really horrible things. Uh, uh, and there, there have been like uh, a, uh, data breaches that we can go about reading about uh, in terms of how uh, social engineering and uh, malicious software as well as uh, credential uh, stuffing is still so common, right? So those are the most common uh, practices followed to get uh, access to somebody's uh, uh, account. And if you see like the top three uh, 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 breaches that have, uh, or the categories of breaches, uh, you will see the same, uh, same things applying there as well. Another interesting fact is uh, if, you, if you check out the, this particular research from Telesign, like 54% uh, of the consumers, they are actually using five or less passwords. So, uh, and 130,000 plus identities and on a constant progression, and this particular number just throws us off, right? So clearly, the first factor is not the only factor. 
uh, we should all be uh, uh, focusing on. We need to add some additional stuff on that. So, uh, and what do we use? Like, uh, what would make sense for our business use case, considering we have such wide, diverse population of users? So I'll just talk through like some of the methods, uh, and uh, we use a range of methods available uh, and apply them based on various use cases, uh, starting from uh, starting from again not the ideal uh, methodology to use uh, is a one-time passcode uh, that is basically sent to your device uh, using SMS or uh, a phone call. Uh, uh, I'm guessing everyone is aware of like what are the uh, risks associated with this around uh, phone number takeovers, SIM, SIM takeovers, uh, man in the middle attacks, all different possible uh, range of uh, attacks that are possible uh, using uh, phone based one time passcode. So clearly not an ideal soli uh, solution, but it's still, uh, if you don't have uh, a second factor enabled, this is still a good uh, or at least an initial step that would uh, take you uh, in the right direction. Uh, but obviously, in our ecosystem, that clearly doesn't fit our use cases, so uh, that goes out of picture. Uh, then the next progression is uh, using the time-based uh, one-time passcodes, uh, where you have an authenticator app, you set that up, and it spits out a code, which are valid for 30 seconds, right? But still exposed to phishing attacks, um, uh, uh, still exposed to a man-in-the-middle attack, so it's totally not, not the right thing to go about. Uh, the next thing, uh, and again, like the authenticator-based approach is again like not an ideal approach for us. So uh, we would like to uh, uh, make it more uh, uh, predominant in our ecosystem. Uh, some more uh, stronger methods. So push notifications. Uh, these are great. Like the pro, uh, the other methods, they don't provide the enough uh, enough context in terms of who and what kind of operation that you're trying to carry out, right? So uh, push notifications gives you that capability. You can include as much contextual information, like, hey, this is stages trying to access like this particular sensitive financial application from San Jose. Uh, is this like really you? Please verify that, right? So that kind of contextual information, it helps make people uh, perform the right decisions, right? To whether to approve or deny the transaction. So, so, this, is, uh, uh, so this gives you that capability. Um, uh, so this, is, this fits a, a larger population of our user base, uh, and where we want to go stripe towards is the next method, where uh, we want to, uh, at, at least on the corporate uh, landscape, um, uh, U2F is what we would like to actually uh, uh, make sure like all our employees are using, right? So in this specific uh, uh, methodology, you have a security key, you would uh, plug it into your device, uh, and you would register that uh, specific uh, security key strongly, uh, uh, phishing resistant, like there's absolutely no, not, no way possible for that, uh, as your credentials are really bound to the origin where you registered, right? So, so really super secure, uh, and establishes a really strong uh, assurance in terms of who the user is, and, uh, uh, and a, a great second factor uh, option. So we have like all these different uh, options available. We pick and choose like what makes sense. Uh, uh, obviously, security keys might not make sense for a really high sensitive production where people are working on. What other options we can use? So we we are basically flexible in terms of uh, what are the options we uh, go about applying. Right. So again, like it's something uh, if you're if you don't have second factor enable, th there are different options available. Uh, uh, probably it'll be better to make a decision in terms of what fits your business use case. But we have second factor. Uh, let's just apply it for everyone, right? Like that would have just been so simple. Let's just apply it for everyone, multi-factor out everyone, every time, any application you go. Uh, let that be, I'm a, uh, users trying to access like a simple lunch menu application. Let's just multi-factor out them, right? Uh, or somebody's trying to uh, go to our sen uh, kind of sensitive, like some sort of a data application where you're uh, getting data out. Uh, that might probably make sense. But if you're going to a financial application, absolutely yes. Like, let's just apply uh, it for them. So there are various application sensitivity aspect, as well as who the user is, what kind of uh, um, uh, 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 the sensitivity aspect of the request that's coming in. Let's take that into account to make our decisions. So this is where we have invested heavily into our adaptive uh, authentication story. So obviously we don't want to uh, multi-factor out everyone every single time. Uh, but let's, how do we go about like, making it so dynamic that it makes sense where actually it's prompted? 
So what we take an approach is we start taking an approach of what our adversaries will think about when they're trying to target us, right? Uh, what are the different things or different patterns that they will be looking out for to uh, basically get into uh, any of our applications? So we start thinking about uh, uh, us, uh, us in, in that direction. Uh, and there are quite a lot of things we take into account. Uh, and we have tried to uh, made it uh, a more of a risk-based approach. Uh, and uh, we establish a risk level associated with every authentication request that is coming in. And what are the factors that we account for? Uh, one unique aspect that we have added into our ecosystem is the likelihood of a user visiting an application. Uh, so how that works is me as stages, I have had previous transactions going to application A, which is a lunch money application, then AWS maybe, uh, and then some really sensitive application. And what kind of access pattern that I've established in terms of kind of applications that I go uh, about visiting. Uh, and what are my other peers actually uh, doing as well? Like what are the kind of applications that these users are going about? So we, uh, we have a machine learning pipeline wherein uh, uh, we taken all previous authentication transaction and inject it into that pipeline, which constantly uh, re-evaluates what uh, a user's typical access pattern might be, right? So that's interesting. Now we can kind of predict what they just might end up going to uh, and uh, what is the likelihood of that uh, and uh, give it a score, all right? So apply that score uh, and then we take into account more things, right? So if I'm an attacker, what I might be thinking of doing? So I might be uh, trying to laterally traverse through different applications, right? So I'm trying to fire off like different applications and uh, every place I go, I'm getting blocked by the second factor prompt, right? I might not be completing those transactions, I just might be abandoning those requests. Uh, or I might be uh, initiating those push, but they might be fail. Uh, or uh, after, even after the push, it gets, uh, user gets a notification, user rejects the request, right? So there are a lot of patterns that can be detected based on previous transactions that I've had. And we use that into uh, another factor to uh, apply uh, a risk associated with that. And if we figure out like, hey, you've abandoned or you've failed like previous X amount of requests, we definitely think that we should be uh, stepping up for you for next few transactions, just to verify it's really you, right? So that's, a, th that's another factor which adds a, a, a higher score if we, if we determine uh, that, right? Then the device itself. So uh, this particular uh, uh, aspect is interesting. So now I've used this specific device like just to uh, establish my trust and I've done successfully uh, second factor. So let's just trust this, give some sort of a trust to this particular device. So what we end up doing is we create a, a, a session cookie and we stick it to the specific device itself. So that gives kind of some sort of an assurance uh, uh, for, for, for where I have previously logged in from, right? Uh, so that adds a little bit of score, uh, giving us some extra assurance on where this request is coming from. Uh, we still would want to uh, uh, keep it per app as well. Uh, if there are really sensitive applications and, uh, and we want to regular, uh, at a regular cadence, we would want to step up. Uh, in that case, we would want to take into account like what is that app uh, look like and what can we do. So application owners can go and specify that, hey, I want my, applications, uh, my application to be doing step up at a regular cadence or every single time, right? It all depends uh, what type of application it is. So, but definitely something to account for. Um, then the location aspect. Uh, where your authentication request is coming from. Uh, and uh, there are quite a few in things around this aspect as well uh, we take into account. Uh, if you are coming from a really risky location, which we deem as risky, uh, we would outright uh, deny you. We'll not even like wait for you uh, to step up, we'll just outright deny you. Uh, but if you're coming from uh, known locations, uh, previous known locations, and all of a sudden you're going to a different location, then it might make sense for us to add some sort of an extra score in addition to all the other facets uh, to it, right? Uh, and that would basically add to, the, uh, uh, to our uh, risk score assessment. And uh, finally, 
Uh, this is uh, 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 an, another interesting aspect that we have added uh, is an app known as Stethoscope, uh, and this is open source. So what we have taken uh, is a different approach to managed devices. So we, the traditional managed devices of collecting device information all the time and crunching uh, information doesn't fit our use case. We want it to be more of uh, uh, a user-driven uh, uh, model wherein we want to empower people with the right amount of information. And so this is a local uh, native application available for uh, Mac and Windows, uh, wherein it'll, give, it'll uh, provide users the right enough information, and it'll guide people through like uh, what you would need to make your device secure, what we think are the right things, right? So feel free to check it out and give us some feedback, uh, uh, and it's, it's on uh, Netflix's uh, GitHub. Uh, so, but that is still good. Like we have a native application, it is uh, telling us some information, but how do we make it really valuable uh, to our uh, adaptive authentication story, right? So what we have done is uh, we have fired this off right in, during the authentication process itself, where in uh, real time, it'll query out your device uh, and uh, it will tell us what exactly is the state of your device. And in this case, uh, firewall is not enabled. It will tell you firewall is not enabled. It will give you instructions on how you would go about uh, uh, enabling firewall. You do that, uh, and yeah, you click on the check again button, and there you go. Like your device is in a state where we think it should be, and now you can go about like accessing your application. So. A different way uh, of us thinking about uh, how uh, uh, around the managed devices aspect and uh, uh, and uh, and how do we use that information. So now, great. So we have so many different uh, factors that we have accounted for, and those are some of the factors that I've highlighted. Uh, but so now uh, we can make smarter decisions uh, to to uh, to our uh, multi-factor auth story uh, and make it right. But it's super complex. And how do we make it simple that it's easy for people to actually integrate into our, uh, into our solution, right? Uh, uh, all great security offerings, but it comes at the expense of how we can make it uh, uh, frictionless. So uh, this is, uh, the answer to that is Meacham. Uh, if you know the House of Cards character, that's where it's named from. So it's basically a federation hub, uh, which is built on top of Pink Federate. Uh, again, like Pink Federal is something that we just use because it uh, helps us, uh, uh, it fits our needs, but there are all, uh, there are great uh, uh, identity providers out there, and all of them, uh, they offer great uh, offerings, so feel free to check them out. Uh, but yeah, so that's basically a federation hub where the previous screen I showed, where we have injected like uh, the, the device health check detection and all the uh, adaptive auth story, it's, uh, it's hooked up there. So, well, how does it go? So. Uh, we have the first factor, obviously. So we federate out to Google for uh, for the auth process, and we federate out to the internal directory service, right, uh, for uh, authing our partners as well. So that and the other interesting aspect is because we have so diverse population, it is important like we have customizable login experiences to fit different use cases. So this is where the uh, the hub also comes into picture, where we, based on different user population, we can uh, uh, present things which are con uh, which makes sense for that user population. Then the second factor, there are so many providers out there again, which one to use. Uh, so in our ecosystem, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, three predominantly so far. Uh, uh, so Google, obviously, when you're accessing anything inside G, uh, G Suite is when you'll use uh, Google's uh, uh, multi-factor options in there. Uh, and then we use Duo to perform our own step up uh, on top of Google, right? So we use that uh, based on our adaptive auth, we will fire off uh, uh, Duo in that case. And for our partner landscape, we use uh, Twilio's Authy, right? Because that helps, uh, uh, because our partners are kind of fitting in the consumer space, so it fits that specific model. And the entire adaptive authentication is, uh, it's, it's real time happening, everything uh, happens real time based on the sensitivity of the request that we are receiving. So it's hooked up direct, uh, directly during the uh, authentication process itself. So all of these things are uh, hooked up uh, during the auth process and these are a range of microservices that we fire off uh, calls to uh, during the process. So as I told, there are other providers out there and it might fit other uh, users' need. Uh, this is Okta's like, rule-based definition of what it makes sense uh, for uh, enabling like multi-factor auth. Uh, it looks pretty promising, so uh, feel free to check that out. And even like one login, right? So they have a kind of similar risk-based uh, assessment approach in there. So you as an organization, uh, if, uh, if 
uh, if second factor is something that we have enabled, but we want to make it smarter, then this might be another great thing to have as well. So great, now we have strong op, we have the, uh, our identity provider in there, but now how do, we, how do these apps actually integrate into, uh, into this particular uh, solution? We definitely don't want uh, to have central admins uh, who are managing these integrations, like working with all these different engineering teams, uh, managing these integrations with them. We wanted to make uh, our engineers, uh, empower our engineers to basically carry out themselves. So this is where we have built a self-service tool uh, which helps uh, uh, register open ID Connect clients. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of takes a delegated approach model where uh, apps can define owners and every, everyone can actually manage those applications and integrations. So you uh, integrate that uh, this way and uh, it provides a range of uh, configuration options uh, in terms of uh, how you would go about configuring your grants, how you do go about configuring your uh, redirect URIs, scopes, and uh, other aspects, which I'll cover in a bit. Um, but yeah, so this is, uh, uh, this is one way for us to help our engineers move forward faster uh, and not uh, be a blocker for them. Another interesting thing in our ecosystem is any new microservice that comes up, uh, there are certain base level things that they get, which we term as base server, right? Uh, and one of the things that they get by default is Apache. So uh, now uh, that adds an interesting twist to our story is like we have a self-service tool which is helping uh, drive the integration, but that can actually spit out Apache conf configuration uh, automatically, which apps can take and uh, add it to their applications. So we use Modoth OpenIDC, uh, 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 the Apache module, for uh, uh, helping applications integrate uh, uh, and, uh, and make their applications secure. So this is what we uh, use. But obviously that would work in an ideal situation where we cover 100% of the use case. But then we have a range of other applications where Apache might not even make sense, right? We have Node.js app, we have uh, single page applications and, and range of technologies. And at Netflix you, can, you are free to use any technology as long as it helps you uh, uh, push uh, the bar to the next level, right? Uh, so in all these cases, obviously, Apache doesn't make sense, and you end up having an Apache avoidance syndrome, right? So, so how do we uh, tackle this situation? So in the past, what we have done is we have recommended applications, various certified like OpenID Connect client libraries, uh, and that had worked great, uh, but it still exposes uh, us two different aspects. One is, A, it's some extra effort which engineers have to do, uh, and they need to understand the terminologies. They need to get themselves tuned to that. And B is like, they need to uh, configure it in the right way without leaving certain routes which uh, an attacker can get through. So it still leaves us some room where things can go wrong, right? And how can we close that gap as well? So over the last one year, we have worked with Amazon very closely on uh, pushing authentication right to the load balancer itself. Uh, so, uh, and great news around that is as of May this year, this has been GA from Amazon, uh, and now you can enable authentication directly at the uh, application load balancer itself. Uh, uh, and it's quite simple in terms of uh, what Amazon today provides in terms of certain base level configuration you just inject there uh, and, uh, and specify the, uh, the port and route on which auth needs to be enabled, and there you go, like auth is enabled for you, right? And uh, it has two different flavors. It, you can hook it up to your own IDP, or you can hook it up to Amazon's Cognito as well. So two different approaches so far, but uh, uh, it's a great step forward uh, uh, in the right direction. Uh, but that's still tedious for an engineer to go into an Amazon console and take in all the configuration and apply themselves. Where can we take this to the next level? Uh, so the answer to that is Spinnaker, which is our continuous like delivery platform. Uh, if you guys are not, uh, are using or, or haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out. It's an awesome continuous delivery platform uh, and, uh, and it's a multi-cloud provider as well. So check it out. So uh, what we have done is we have strongly integrated with Spinnaker uh, internally. Uh, with the self service tool that uh, tool that we have, so this is a snippet of how you would do it on Spinnaker. Uh, you go and configure, try to configure the uh, ALB listener in there, uh, and enable the auth authentication rule in there, uh, and a couple configuration clicks, and you specify the base level attributes in here. All right. 
So this is the OSS version what I'm uh, screenshots that I've presented. Uh, there's a different flavor for our internal use, wherein this is still few configuration elements that you have to fill out. Uh, but uh, internally, what we have done is, when you enable the, the when you click on that specific button, it strongly uh, integrates with our internal tool. And the only thing that you need to, need to do is just click that button, and everything is wired out uh, automatically for you. So it's just, uh, 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 and what we term that as a zero configuration, where you just click and things are working as expected. So that's, uh, that's how we have tried to take our approach. Uh, uh, Apache works great for a lot of applications. If things don't work, then yes, like load balancer is the way to go. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if you don't care about anything apart from just having auth enable, then that's the way to go. If you want like some really custom configuration that you want to do, then yeah, sure, like uh, let's, let's talk about Apache. Uh, so, so great, so now we have auth enabled on pretty much every application uh, in our ecosystem. Uh, and that means I've done a strong auth, I've done step up when required, uh, and I've accessed this particular ac application. But does that mean that Tejas, the engineer, should be able to access a financial application versus Tejas, the engineer, trying to access some engineering application, right? Like, do we, ne we need to have some other level of uh, uh, assurance around that? And that's where we uh, uh, authorization comes into picture. So authorization is also very crucial to us uh, in terms of who gets access to what. Um, so at the really high level, in the same self service tool you have, you can apply some authorization rules right there itself, indicating that, hey, this application, it's available for any class of particularly, uh, any class of users, or I want to like restrict it down to like certain class of folks, right? A certain user base, certain group base, uh, certain other user attributes, like totally you can do that. Uh, and it's a same cell service tool you will end up using, right? Uh, this might work great to have like authorization out of box available, but it might not work for pretty much uh, every class of application. We would still want some sort of a way to communicate the identity information down to these applications so that they can actually apply some other fine grained authorization rules if they like to. So another interesting aspect that we have added is, hey, tell us what attributes you want us to package for you, right? So when you are configuring a client, you would indicate what attributes you care about, and we will package that up into an access token and uh, uh, pass it down the application. Or you can, if you're on the client side, you can just uh, call out to the user info endpoint, and you will get the same kind of attributes. So, so yeah, so uh, different uh, classes of attributes, and everyone can just pick and choose uh, whatever they uh, works for, for them. So this helps us uh, achieve like uh, some sort of an authorization aspect as well. Uh, there are other uh, other internal services that are primarily focused in our ecosystem, doing uh, even finer grain authorization. But this provides applications in gen uh, a base level authorization that they can really opt into. So, so yeah, so. The, the story around like we, we were two years ago, we were at one state and now we have no parameter, no managed devices. And the core ingredients that, we, uh, that, fall, that aligns with our security story is, hey, we need to have unified identity, make sure we don't have duplicate identities, uh, apply single sign-on uh, and have authentication enabled for every application. And then we uh, uh, strong authentication, including adaptive auth uh, authorization and range of other factors. So, so that's our story. Uh, in terms of how uh, we have uh, taken our approach and uh, uh, made our uh, security story pretty strong so far. Um, and that's about it, I guess. Uh, so one thing I want to highlight here is we are hiring. We are outside as well. We have a booth. So feel free to check out uh, uh, jobs at like jobs.netflix.com. And if you have anything uh, that interests you, feel free to hit me up or, or reach out to us outside. Uh, yeah. Happy to take questions. Yeah. I'm curious about the stethoscope application. Sure. Uh, if the, say, the user firewall is not in place, mm -hmm. is that going to prevent a login, or is that just a recommendation to the user? So th there are different approaches to that. Uh, so uh, firewall not enabled, it might not make sense to what type of application that you're trying to go to. Uh, but if it's a really sensitive app and we feel like all these 10 factors that we have is absolute must, then we'll enforce a, a, a mandatory required. Uh, yeah, you can totally. Uh, we can we can customize based on that. 
but as it stands today, we uh, it's a more uh, more of an inf uh, informational perspective, at least from a range of applications that we have hooked up set scope with. Uh, but yeah, the long term vision is we want to make uh, app based um, uh, rules indicating like which what is mandatory and when it's not required, right? So totally yes. Yeah. Any other? Uh, you mentioned that there's multiple methods for MFA. Um, obviously, some of them are more secure than others, like well, sure. but SMS is. Uh, Secure. In fact, uh, did uh, uh, IT or something like that uh, actually disqualify this as a factor of the point? Yeah. So, uh, and it's. Did you allow uh, all of your users to use SMS for a second factor, or do you disqualify yeah. that option for something? So, right. I don't offer SMS as any factor for anyone. Uh, uh, but we have kept it as an option. If there's a really high profile user coming in and you want to really enable it for, still enable the second factor aspect and we don't have to have that entire like cumbersome aspect, then we'll still try to, uh, better than nothing. Uh, but as it stands today, we don't enable SMS for any, any class of population, yeah. 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 Having worked for financial institutions, making sure all the laptops were encrypted and Super duper lockdown and whatnot. What are you guys doing on that side uh, when people just pick up going devices? So we, that's what we have moved ourselves away from uh, uh, the entire managed device aspect completely. Uh, and the way we, we think that we should educate, uh, we believe in educating people, and this is where our culture comes into picture. So we believe like, as long as I tell you that, hey, looks like your laptop is not uh, uh, locked, your screen lock is not enabled, or, or your device is not encrypted, uh, we'll give you informational messages using the stethoscope application, but uh, if we think that you're trying to access some sensitive application, and we think that you should enable that, uh, before we can trust your, have a strong assurance on your device, we will outright block you till you fix that uh, particular aspect. So are you encrypting the drive? Uh, you mean on the actual endpoint itself? Well, yeah, like, it's like right now, I mean, for bank, it's like when we lose a laptop. Sure. We really so we get into the business of encrypting it, but like out of the box, obviously Mac provides that uh, device encryption aspect. So we will let people know that, hey, uh, please enable that particular device encryption aspect in there, uh, and uh, and enable. So we don't encrypt specifically like devices. Yeah. Uh, loss prevention. So kind of in terms of his issue. He might care about an encrypted oh God, laptop yeah. in case someone takes the laptop and then gets the bank data. What do you guys think about that? Like, if I take some Netflix engineer's laptop, sure. What is the? Is there anything involved with that? Yeah. Like uh, you can, uh, we, we don't uh, we don't care about that uh, that much. Uh, as long as uh, we so basically the way our approach is a little different in that space is uh, uh, we encourage people not to store sensitive information on your devices, right? We want everything on the on the cloud, um, and uh, and specifically in our ecosystem, we use drives heavily. So there's no reason for you to have things on your device, uh, even if you're working uh, uh, remotely uh, or even in offline scenarios, uh, but. Uh, having said that, uh, there, there might be outliers who will be still doing it, but our approach to that is make sure screen lock is enabled, make sure f device encryption is enabled on your local device, and, uh, and that's how we would uh, recommend you uh, during the live authentication process. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cost implications associated with it? Are you finding it's cheaper to run this way, more secure, or is it expensive to run this way? Uh, uh, you mean to say in the endpoint itself? Oh, so uh, in a way, uh, I wouldn't say cost as a, a, an aspect, but in a way of, especially around the securing the network perimeter, uh, it's just too involving to have uh, that kind of mindset available, right? Uh, in terms of having strong uh, tunneling available between uh, uh, b between our uh, whatever, like the corporate network itself. Uh, but uh, our our approach to, uh, to that is, regardless of what I what the security perimeter uh, I have within when you're within the Netflix boundaries, that defeats the purpose when you go outside the boundary, anyways, right? So, so yeah, it's like why don't just make our applications more secure? And uh, and uh, another thing is like getting onto VPN is too cumbersome, right? Uh, it's just too annoying to uh, to be using that. 
So why not just go away from that model and why not just make things available, everything available externally, and, and there's no reason for us to uh, be worried about as long as we can detect anything wrong that's gonna happen uh, uh, and any wrong thing that can impact us. I don't think so cost is a factor that we, we take into account, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we believe in like, uh, uh, having stronger detection, using our data more uh, efficiently, uh, and cost is the last thing that we care about. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, I mean, not an increase in attack traffic uh, to our applications, but we, we definitely uh, uh, have more detection going on now. So, uh, and based on our metrics, we, we can clearly identify like various malicious patterns that we can uh, outright see uh, and how successfully we've been able to like block those uh, outright access uh, completely. So that just gives us a, a more assurance aspect in terms of the investments have been the right investments that we have done so far. Any questions? Yeah. So, um, you said that uh, you Google the uh, Yeah, for the local side. Yes, but so you're pushing your AD up to Google? Is that what you're doing? So, AD is an interesting aspect, uh, uh, and uh, I have a few colleagues on the back who are uh, giving me a smile, but AD is an uh, interesting aspect. Uh, we as Netflix, uh, at least on the corporate side, we are. Our vision is to move away completely from AD, uh, and there are outlying like legacy applications, especially the Atlassian suite of apps, that still rely on AD specifically lookup. So what we have done is uh, uh, a different model where we are using Google as a uh, primary IDP for the uh, for the uh, employee side of it, uh, and we we uh, stream that identity information down to our corp AD itself, and that is primarily used for lookups, no authentications uh, uh, carried out. But yes, so Google is also working towards having Google LDAP as a core thing. Uh, it's, not, it's still not GA, it's I think B, uh, beta or something of that sort, yeah. So uh, we've been uh, closely working with Google on that aspect as well. Do you apply the policy if somebody works in your office? Or are you crowding them back out, like there's no parameter and then back in? Or, so you're enforcing 2FA even if somebody sits in one of your yeah. offices? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because I, as I told you, even our net, uh, even our uh, Wi-Fi is considered to be like an unsecure uh, 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 network itself. So regardless, you're coming internal, external. Yes, it's the same. The policies apply. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Do you assign a risk score to a user based on their location, device, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you have a static number for a certain application that you would see below 85 to access it? Yeah. Is based on what you've seen happening with that application? So the way we categorize a risk score is based on a low, medium, high kind of category, all right? And so each of those factors, they go into that low, medium, high category. Uh, and if, for example, let me just pick up a location aspect. If you're coming from, let's say, a risky location, let's say North Korea, right? Uh, in that case, we would uh, bump up the score uh, really high, and that becomes the most factor that uh, count, uh, accounts for the risk factor, right? So every facet is class uh, classified as low, medium, high, and based on that, we uh, rank the scores. So is your application, your access, is it the only application statically, or can it be adaptive and say, if there's been 10,000 authorized attempts to that application overnight, it needs to be a high now? Yes. So it goes by app to app as well. So if you're going to a lunch menu application, it should be like really low bar, right? Uh, so, uh, and by default, uh, every application is considered to be in a top category, and you can downgrade yourself uh, uh, to a low category application. So any new application comes out, it gets the most secure option out, out of the box, and then you can downgrade yourself based on, uh, based on your decision making. But yes, and the reason why I've kept it uh, finer grain so that applications can actually make the right decisions using a self-service tool itself so that they can indicate like what kind of uh, level we think we should uh, set for our application. So that's why it gives us more flexibility to tweak around, but everyone just gets a base level if, you're not, if you have not tweaked. Yeah. So what's the factor level from Hulu's AS? <laughs> really high. <hard. laughs> Yeah, outright deny. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
your answer is what system are you using for adaptive authentication? So what system you mean? Yeah, what system? All of this is homegrown solution, like what I just said, uh, Spectre. And any factor that you saw, it's, uh, so we have one particular microservice that's uh, doing all the decision making that talks to our uh, internal identity provid uh, providers, in this case, like Google, as well as uh, our internal directory service to get like user data as well. So, so yeah, so there's microservice that does the decision making and then uh, talks to other microservice to call out like the different uh, multi-factor providers as well. Yeah, but everything is homegrown solution. Another thing I wanted to highlight, like all of these different facets that we covered, like uh, I'm also looking for feedback if anyone's interested in any aspect which we have not open source yet. Uh, we can chat about it and what, and you can think about it as well. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? All right, thank you so much.